Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first ever episode on the PTNW portion, a place where guests that have already appeared on the show can give their insight on topics discussed in their respective episode appearances, and even introducing new topics of discussion, which the guest may have a lot of perspectives on. PTNW encourages and promotes healthy dialogue about subjects that pique the guest's interests and aim to entertain and inform listeners like you. I'm your co-host, Dari Kareem. I'm your other co-host, Jeremiah Alondra. And today we're joined by our guest for this episode and our previous guest on Season 1, Episode 3, Jacob Rybinki, who has chosen the topic of space for today's discussion. Welcome to the show. Uh, It's a pleasure to be on again, and I'm excited to talk about this. So for space, a big question that many may have for, you know, space enthusiasts and space technology enthusiasts is what is one prototype rocket test that has fascinated you about what's to come with space exploration and innovation in space technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you may know, uh, recently there was a a test of the Starhopper, which is, as you said, it's a prototype rocket. It was actually the final test of it before they move on to more complex rockets. And basically the Starhopper, it's like a mock-up of the Starship which is uh, the spacecraft that SpaceX is going to build for Mars exploration Mm -hmm. and other things. And the Starhopper, it kind of looks like a, uh, like a small grain silo with the rocket engine on the bottom. And basically its aim is to test some new technologies pertaining to Starship uh, and to kind of test the mechanics and the physics of actually landing, propulsively landing a spacecraft like that. And it's also testing the Raptor engine. So a few days ago they flew it and, they, re- they flew it to a height of about 150 meters, and then they flew it sideways a bit, and then you know, they landed it back propulsively. Yeah, and Starhopper, it flew for the first time on July 25th, but it only got about like 60 feet. Mm-hmm. Starhopper has only been flying with like one yeah. Raptor engine, but the final design for Starship calls for six. So it's really innovative. Honestly, this, is, this shows us a good idea of what we can expect from the Starship's power, because three of the Raptor engines out of the six for Starship will be used on Earth, and then the other three will be used for the vacuum of space. It's a really great visual of what we can expect from SpaceX, who has really been innovating, uh, especially now for the past couple months, on what we can expect in space. Mm -hmm. And more on the Raptor engine, it's it's a really innovative engine uh, mm. because it it it's not like the engines of the old the engines of antiquity you know like the ones used on the saturn V or other rockets even modern rockets because it uses a fundamentally different fuel system so instead of using something like uh you know rp1 or hydrogen liquid oxygen it actually uses uh methane liquid oxygen so it allows for a much more efficient design a much newer design and it's way better for reusability. Starship is also quite intriguing. It's a super heavy lift rocket, which as of current designs can carry up to 100 people. That explains why six engines, six Raptor engines are needed. That's going to be very useful for carrying cargo and taking crews to Mars. Exactly. And Starship is basically very different from what we've seen before with any other spacecraft. Because Personally, what's always bugged me about spacecraft is that unlike something like a car or, you know, even an airplane, never before have they been obviously reusable. But so they've always seemed kind of, you know, really clunky and not very efficient. And they they kind of aren't. But uh, even with something like the Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy, which obviously are reusable rockets, or even some of the Blue Origin rockets, they just they still seem kind of like those old rockets, you know, a little bit clunky. They can only carry like uh, a capsule, which sure can carry a lot of weight, but you know, it's small. You can't have a true kind of like almost like a space plane. And obviously there's a space shuttle, but again, it, that was still really small and it had a bunch of unreusable parts. But now with Starship, you have this, you know, spacecraft, which you can take to basically anywhere in our solar system because it's a super heavy lift rocket. And not only is it like that, but it's not just a small capsule. It's almost like, uh, like Elon Musk has said, it's almost going to be like a, a cruise ship, but a spacecraft. 
that you have, you know, bigger living quarters, they can hold a bunch of people, a, a nice cockpit, you know, everything is modernized. And unlike the previous rockets, this one is actually cheap enough and big enough that it's, it's starting to seem more like rockets are becoming a mainstream kind of transport and not just this once in the blue moon experience. <clears throat> Yeah, and SpaceX has a lot of big plans for Mars, especially to like send materials in unmanned starships. It's planning in the early 2020s for this to happen, and then they can send crew later in the decade. And tying it a little bit back into Starhopper, what we can expect from Starhopper, like the next test will include two prototypes, which is called Mark 1 and Mark 2. And uh, they were developed in Boca Chica in Texas and Florida, respectively. And these prototypes are outfitted with more engines, which are bigger and more complex, and they're designed to be a better representation of the final vehicle. So then we can actually know what we can expect, you know, in space. Uh, yeah, uh, I always hear about these things in the news, like um, the Mars expedition, the uh, the Dear Moon project um, that SpaceX will launch in 2023, I believe. Um, Jacob, can you give a little bit? more insight on the future innovations about uh, uh, that SpaceX is uh, making? Well, yeah, I think SpaceX really reflects uh, Elon Musk's kind of eccentricities and um, one kind of idiosyncrasy of Elon Musk uh, as compared to other uh, billionaires and other company owners is that he sets really ambitious and really optimistic goals. But the thing about that is <clears throat> even if you miss that goal, you're still years ahead of the competition. So they still end up uh, developing a really amazing product in a small amount of time. So they have these timeframes, like they want to send, you know, uh, unmanned starships to Mars somewhere like 2022, 2025, and even try and get humans there uh, this decade, which in my opinion is very ambitious and I doubt it'll happen. But I think something like, like you said, like the moon, uh, moon base or sending materials to moon is definitely possible within this decade. And then Mars, you know, I think in the early 2030s and late 2020s, we can start sending more stuff to Mars and preparing, you know, humans for a Mars base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Elon Musk has been very ambitious with SpaceX, you know, with the Dear Moon project, as you were just mentioning, Jeremiah, um, he's intending on having the Japanese billionaire, entrepreneur, and art collector Yusaku Maizawa. And Maizawa um, actually was seeking several artists, you know, to join him on his expedition. It's really something to look forward to, and it's really a great project. So, yeah, that's definitely one front that shows how ambitious uh, Musk is with, exactly. you know, his projects with SpaceX. Yeah. Talking more about the moon base, right? Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how important it is to get back to the moon because this time it's not just uh, because of the space age or something. It's not just kind of an accomplishment. Uh, this time they want to uh, prepare for a permanent or you know uh, uh, almost permanent residence on the moon. And the reason why that's so important is not only for scientific purposes, you know, to see how people would survive there, and it's also for uh, exploration purposes because it's way easier to launch a rocket to the moon than refuel it there because the moon is plant it has a bunch of resources which you can use to make fuel so you re refuel the rocket there and then you can send it to mars or basically any other planet so it kind of serves as this gateway almost like a uh, interstellar or uh, interplanetary gas station basically so you know you can send uh, robots there to mine things and then process that into the fuel, refuel it, and go anywhere you want. So it makes the trip not only shorter, but much more efficient. And I think I know where you're getting at. You're talking about helium-3, right? Because there's a lot of mining that's happening on the moon surface. Like One cargo hold of helium-3 can actually fuel the United States for a year, I believe. It also serves you know, not just like a residential purpose, but also you know, scientific, because that's always been the ultimate goal of these companies like SpaceX and these agencies like NASA and even, you know, other countries, space agencies like the European Space Agency, they've had a lot of uh, hopes to be able to mine helium-3. They've got their sights set on continuing scientific work on the moon and, of course, to try to get this isotope 
And even on the topic of mining, uh, another endeavor, which I see happening in the next few decades, is probably asteroid mining. Because again, if you set up a base on the moon, you can easily access that, and it becomes sort of like a commodity or something. You know, it's almost like oil on Earth, because there's so many resources in those asteroids that one asteroid, you know, uh, could be, some of those asteroids have so much, say, let's, you know, gold or iron or silver, that it would offset the entire kind of economy based on that. So if you mine one of those asteroids with gold, gold would become worthless on Earth. But another thing that that offers is that kind of rarish uh, materials on the Earth, you can just easily get it with the asteroid in the future. So basically, those materials become incredibly accessible, and it lets us build even more things. And not only that, but, you know, it becomes a lot cheaper. So basically, it's just this cycle of you discover more and make it cheaper, and then you can send out more uh, asteroid miners, etc. And while we're on the topic of like these scientific innovations, let's talk a little bit about Starlink. Now, Starlink's been like very popular nowadays, um, you know, as like a topic of discussion. Uh, so, what are your thoughts about Starlink? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about Starlink, right, is uh, there is some uh, kind of like controversy around it, uh, especially in like the astronomy community, just because um, the way the Starlink satellites are built. Uh, they're not coded with anything uh, that doesn't make them reflective or there's no measures to make them not reflect non-reflective. So they'll actually kind of photobomb, um, you know, uh, telescope pictures, which is a big problem because obviously the astronomy community needs these pictures uh, for science and just as a hobby. So you don't want to see this like these like big white streaks on your picture. You know, you, you want to see the sky and it's almost like another form of light pollution. So um, Elon and SpaceX have proposed solutions for them for that. Uh, well, A, they're going to have trackers on them, obviously. So astronomers can track them and kind of plan around it. But some astrological events, obviously, you can't plan around. So they wanted to paint them with some kind of non-reflective surface. But there's still issues with that because sometimes it can cause the satellite to overheat or it's just not perfect enough. So even though they provide this huge benefit, obviously it's not all good. But speaking of the benefit, um, it'll obviously hopefully provide cheaper internet to developed countries maybe, and actually provide internet to undeveloped countries and developing countries, which currently don't have great internet or anything like that. So it is a good endeavor. And I think it would happen eventually, whether or not SpaceX actually did it. So you always have that kind of problem of having these like, big constellations of satellites because spacex is I, I forget the exact figure but i think it's like tripling the amount of um working satellites in orbit you know these huge uh, constellations of satellites so you know it does pose a uh, risk to astronomy but it also poses big benefits to just the state of technological development yeah there's like a lot of Pros and cons, I suppose you say. Yeah, and they are looking to spin it off as, or possibly spin it off as a separate country or not country company. Uh, and that's honestly not a bad idea because if you think about it, it's a pretty big business, you know, providing internet to so many people, and they're the first to do it. So they can make a lot of money with this, just like you know, some people were the first to computing or the first to the internet, and even Elon was like that. So if you're the first to this kind of business of uh, putting sat many satellites into space and providing internet to so many people, you know, you can easily make a lot of money. Yeah, that's incredible, right? It's a very ambitious plan, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. We've seen a lot of SpaceX's success. Recently, the human-rated SpaceX ship, which is Crew Dragon, actually recently came back and it's already preparing for another mission. But we've also seen things like the static launch fire. It's SN5, it's the Starship SN5 test vehicle. And it took to the skies for about 40 seconds on August 4th near the South Texas village of Boca Chica where SpaceX conducts a lot of their tests. It's a real big indicator that going to Mars is a real possibility yeah. and it's a real big win for yeah the you know, space community. Yep. And also, 
on the topic of Mars, there's also the recent launch of uh, Perseverance, again, just a few weeks ago or a few days ago, um, which is basically uh, the Curiosity rover, which is about the size of a car and it's loaded with scientific instruments. So they're, they are reusing a lot of the technology from that, but they are obviously iterating over Curiosity, fixing a lot of the flaws and adding a bunch more uh, scientific equi equipment. So not only is the camera way better because obviously that technology has really flourished in recent years. So we'll get great full color images of that. But it also has uh, improved wheels, uh, obviously more science equipment, including uh, kind of like a payload drop off. So basically it'll drill a uh, Martian rock obviously, and then it'll uh, package it and kind of leave it in strategic points, which they've already determined. Um, and then in the future, which it's slated to be in like some time in the 2030s, because you know NASA's timeline is a lot slower than something like SpaceX. But in the future, they're planning on picking those up. So the point of that is that before any human step foot on Mars, you want to at least have some kind of <clears throat> like safe keep uh, of Martian rocks. Because what if the humans inadvertently uh, you know, infect all that rock with uh, earth bacteria and whatnot in Earth's life. So you want to have some kind of like sealed uh, rocks and sealed, uh, you know, soil so that you know what's The happening. big thing was Curiosity. It only lasts 687 days. It saw big improvements. Jet Propulsion Laboratory actually made a lot of big improvements on it, set for NASA's Mars 2020 mission, uh, which we did see launch so that's something looking forward to in terms of like scientific discoveries mm -hmm. and I, I forgot to mention another big thing is it's actually going to carry obviously the first um uh the first uh flight uh test on mars so you'll they'll get to see what a reduced atmosphere and reduced gravity really does to the uh to flight so, you know, they're launching the, so it, it looks kind of like a, a drone, but with only one central rotor instead of a quadricopter, because that's not feasible on Mars. And they really had to engineer it to work. So uh, not only is it really robust, but, um, you know, there's good battery technology in it and it actually rotates incredibly fast. And the rotors are thin and big because obviously when you have that reduced atmosphere, it's really hard to generate lift. So it has to rotate, I think, like 1,200 rotations per minute. And the wing, the span of the rotors is really large. Delving a little bit deeper into NASA's contributions, NASA has done a lot for the space community, obviously. And like you were saying, they launched Perseverance, which was a, a very helpful. It replaced Curiosity, which is now defunct. And let's talk a little bit more about you know, what we can expect in the future, what we are expecting in the future from NASA is specifically about the Artemis missions, which is the, uh, you know, twin sister of the Apollo missions. What are some things that we can expect? Mm -hmm. Well, what we can expect is uh, a, um, the kind of furthering of the private sector in space. So uh, NASA will be handling the launch of the astronauts on their SLS rocket, but almost everything else is going to be done in the private sector with companies like SpaceX and other companies that they, um, you know, they pay to do all these things. So SpaceX will, will fly some of the stuff there and private companies are also going to design a lot of the equipment that's going to go in there. And another Another difference from the Apollo <clears throat> era missions is that in the Apollo era, uh, obviously, it was still in its infancy. So they had to carry everything with them, uh, which greatly limited the amount of stuff they can carry and the size of it and in intricacy of it. So, you know, like if they wanted to bring uh, a buggy or something like that, which they did, uh, they have to carry it with the astronauts on that one spacecraft. But today, nowadays, what they're going to do is they're going to strategically land all of that equipment on the moon. So the only thing traveling with astronauts is them and you know some supplies. Uh, and also they're going to build yeah, a small space station um, around the moon. We've been seeing a lot of innovations for the Artemis missions. 
Uh, we have like exploration ground systems. We have the space launch system. We have Orion, which is a spacecraft for lunar missions. Um, we have Gateway, which is the lunar outpost around the moon, which is going to be really helpful considering that now NASA can pre-stage compared to, you know, in the Apollo era, there had to be like an expendable lunar lunar lander. It's a lot easier if you can pre-stage, if you can select what areas you want to go on the moon. Also, of course, there's the Artemis Generation spacesuits. We're seeing a big difference between the Apollo era missions and the new Artemis era missions. There's a lot to look forward to. There's a lot of innovation. Um, yeah. And it, it's great to see that um, they're actually, you know, modernizing it, bringing modern technology to the moon. And I think it's a it's a continuation, obviously, of the 60s and the moon landing then. Because back then, everybody thought, you know, um, we already landed a person on the moon. Uh, what's next? You know, like they thought maybe in the 80s we'll be on Mars. But the problem is uh, it really came out of the public sphere. And obviously the way that it works politically is that means that it lost funding. So, you know, you never kind of saw more stuff on the moon and we never really saw anything with Mars. It kind of stagnated. But now there's been probably because of private companies like SpaceX and whatnot, there's been a real resurgence uh, of kind of like a, a 2020s space race. We're not really racing anybody, obviously, but, you know, this time we're trying to actually go to Mars, go to the moon. And I think the coolest part about it is we're not only going to actually start going back, but we're going to try and establish a permanent presence. So, you know, building bases, that's actually part of the agenda and building a, a space station around the moon, you know, planning ahead for the future to actually be in, you know, live in space. Yeah. And about the space launch system, we're seeing a lot of new Thing. We're seeing the launch abort system, which will make sure that the astronauts are safe in case you know, anything goes wrong. We're going to be seeing the spacecraft for lunar missions, once again, Orion, which is human rated. Uh, we're going to be seeing like core stage, two massive, like solid rocket boosters. We're seeing great parts being put into use. And in many ways, it's, you know, exceeds the power of the Saturn V rocket, which was you know, considered like legendary among many, it's going to be a lot more powerful than that. We're going to be seeing increasing like safety and ensuring the astronauts are safe because that's truly the priority. That's what's being kept in mind, the astronauts. Yeah. Well, one thing I, you know, I have a gripe with is that it's kind of um, strange that, you know, you would think that now that we have so many great rockets, you know, starships, Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and the Blue Origin rockets are coming uh, dead delusion. And, uh, you know, the, now that we see all these great rockets, you know, you would think, why are we trying to build this SLS, which is expensive, you know, it's and it's also expendable because most parts of it are not reusable, uh, unlike, you know, these new rockets. So it just seems archaic and old. So you might, you know, you think, why are we using it? Which it kind of shows the bureaucracy of, you know, the government and NASA. Because obviously the program was announced uh, quite a few years ago, and now they're finally nearing like the actual rendition of it, actual flying of the rocket. So obviously once you get that like train started, you can't stop. So you know even though it would probably be a better idea to fly the astronauts on like Starship or some kind of reusable rocket or new rocket, uh, we're gonna have to you know deal with uh, something like the SLS. Yeah, and a big question that many would have is. Why should we be focusing on going to the Why should we be focusing on space instead of the problems that we have here on Earth? Yeah, like what's your response to that? Mm -hmm. Well, my response, there's a lot of people that say that, you know, NASA is a big waste of tax money or whatnot. But what most people don't realize is, A, um, they don't actually, you know, they don't actually get that much money. Like the military gets anywhere between like 600 billion and a trillion dollars of funding, depending on the budget, whereas NASA usually gets around 20 billion, uh, sometimes even less. And not only that, but also nowadays the private sector is obviously becoming even more involved, which, you know, means that there's technically less tax dollars flowing into it. But another thing is that most people don't realize how much NASA has actually developed. You know, you, you can look up and uh, you can look it up and there's, you know, lists of items 
that have been developed as a result of some of like the moon landings or the ISS or, you know, technology in space, you know, so you have like untethered power tools, you know, memory foam, uh, a lot of technology to preserve food, things like that. And obviously, it's also for the posterity of basically humanity, because once you're interplanetary, it's a lot harder to, you know, be wiped out and you kind of have a plan B. Yeah, absolutely. What most people actually don't realize, like you were saying, is when it comes to like looking at how the U.S. budget like is split holistically, most of it goes to welfare programs and also the military. NASA gets only like a little sliver of it. Still, even still, uh, there's private companies like SpaceX mm-hmm. that are really contributing to uh, the future that we can have in our presence and our scientific discoveries in space. And the big thing is that it solves a lot of problems here on Earth investing in space, investing in these different technologies that are out in space. For example, we can even talk about satellites that are out there. There's examples Mm -hmm. like SMAP, which can be used to find crop yields. Exactly. And then there's also, you know, uh, hyper prevalent technologies like, uh, you know, GPS and uh, like Google Maps, for instance, you know, you use that without knowing it, but that's all satellite. And also another thing space poses is it's almost like a it's like a clean slate. It's a it's a chance to uh, make uh, kind of an international effort to come together instead of on Earth where there's you know where there's borders and the politics and everything. You know, in space there's actually a chance for people to work together, and you can see it in the ISS and whatnot. Definitely, yeah. Um, there's a chance to work together to make something greater because unlike you know the borders on Earth. There's no countries in space. You know, you can't claim land for your country in space. You can only collaborate with others and make it an international effort. Yeah, because that's the end in the Outer Space Treaty. Yeah, Exactly. And also, I think people just aren't inclined to do that because when you're an astronaut or whatever the equivalent is for a country, you know, you're seen as like almost like a hero. You know, you're, not many people get to do that. So the last thing you want to do is to isolate yourself from everybody else. And, you know, try and make it a political thing. Yeah, and space is really our second chance to both improve our situation here on Earth and to have like a plan B, discover planets, uh, things like that. So that's going to conclude today's podcast. We did mention on episode three of season one that Jacob was actually designing some things for the channel. You may notice the new thumbnails and you may notice the new banner and like wallpaper art for our channel so a big thank you to jacob for that and for joining us on the first ever episode of the ptnw portion and a big thank you to you for listening to the show